and the last week of supply chain management. I did send you guys an email. Remember to go and um, uh, do your end of course uh, evaluation, please. Um, I'm, I, I owe you guys, uh, some of you, guys, I, I still owe response on week three individual assignment. <clears throat> and I owe you guys all week four uh, grades uh, for the team and the individual assignments. I'll get them knocked out this Saturday and I'll get final grades uh, submitted uh, by this time next week. If you owe me assignment, uh, make sure I get it Saturday morning because uh, I'm going to knock them all out then. And by the way, congratulations, right? Last last supply chain clash, the ju guys jump in the Master Business Project 3 tomorrow. And uh, after that, you go on to graduation. So great job and uh, congratulations. Tonight, what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll go to the uh, team presentations first. It's only three teams, so we should have time to go through the, uh, this, this uh, lesson. This is a real short lesson on the uh, supply chain maturity and best practices, uh, so we should have any time. <clears throat> any questions on anything related to the supply chain management course? How about any questions on uh, uh, National Graduate School or, or, uh, or the New England uh, Business College? Nope. You guys want to jump into your uh, team presentations? Who, who would like to go first? Can you guys still hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, we Okay, you want, me, you want me to pick who goes first? You only got three teams, right? You got Team UTC, uh, Team Prime Aircraft, and uh, Team Master Business Project Eaton. I got everybody's slides open, so Team Team Variation, you guys are up. All right, so Team Variation, uh, it's Myself, Dave Gargi, Ron, Sam, and Danielle. Next slide. So um, our MVP has pretty simple supply chain as far as um, the product that we're talking about um, just for the MVP. So we have raw material that comes in, and we have three raw material suppliers, and then we have of course, consumable materials, which is um, from a warehouse like uh, Fastenal or something like that. And then we have um, welding gases and consumables uh, from a welding point of view, and those come from air gas. So um, those are our main material suppliers for the product. And then, of course, we have utilities. So um, in this uh, map here, it shows that, uh, like, National Grid, uh, for electricity and um, we also have water and those kind of things so um, a very small supply chain for this project it goes from the suppliers to the manufacturing which is eaton and we also do the distribution out of eaton the same building and then it gets shipped from there directly to our customer next slide So um, geographically, the pretty small geographical location, really. I mean, um, it's all in Northeast United States. So Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. Um, a lot of the, uh, the welding supply stuff and the consumables are right in Rhode Island, right by the manufacturing plant. And then we get raw material from Connecticut and Pennsylvania. So um, like I said, very simple supply chain. We have the raw material that comes into Eaton. We manufacture, warehouse, distribute, all in Rhode Island. And then the customer is actually in Connecticut, also in East Hartford. So um, very small amount of transportation and logistics 
that go into that. Next slide. There's a thread diagram. It kind of uh, it shows supply, manufacturing, customer. We have our raw material and our consumables, and um, we want to keep those suppliers at less than 100 dppm and 95% on-time delivery or better. And then in the manufacturing process, the key is first-pass yield. So our customers' on-time delivery is key, and to get there, we need first-pass yield. So first-pass yield. Um, and manufacturing is 95% or better is the goal. And that's where um, we would also, when the product gets beaten, that's where the turnaround would be for uh, discrepant material back to the raw material suppliers if uh, we need to out of our inspection department. And then from there, um, it goes to the customer. Um, On-time delivery goal there is 100%. Um, this uh, product is critical for um, manufacturing engine manufacturing so we're a one for one every every part part that we build goes directly into an engine so um, there's no um, shelf time for these parts at all they go there they go directly in and uh, they start getting used so there's no time there uh, next slide So um, success measurement and uh, for our MBT, we have a first pass yield problem, right? So the problem statement is, or opportunity is to increase first pass yield. Um, and that was to, by reducing scrap and rework, increasing first pass yield um, and preventing line stoppage at our customer. So we have our heat treat process that is our constraint in our project. And the problem there is, is that there's not a good way to um, choose the tool that you're gonna use to heat treat the parts. So in our system, um, our MVP, we actually um, came up with a way to clean the parts so that the weight is more um, uniform for each part. And then we use the weight to pick the tool we need. So um, it's pretty intricate project and um, there's a lot of pieces to it but um that's the overall for it so if we can keep the weight consistent of each piece we can pick the right heat tree restrainer and then our first pass yield will go up our scrap will go down and um, the customer will be happy on time delivery will be good next slide Can we is this the next one or do we skip one? Yep, sorry. Um, so performance metrics, um, material flow are measured uh, on time delivery percentages. And um, just as I said on the, the beginning slides there, the customer is just in time and we every part is one for one. So we make a part, it goes directly into the assembly at the customer and uh, there's no time for any disruptions in the system. Next slide. And then potential improvement. So consolidation of raw material suppliers. Um, it's, it's very difficult. We have three raw material suppliers. They all um, buy their, um, it's foil material. It's really thin um, steel sheet and so they all have the same the same exact material um, that they stock and we keep three suppliers just in case there's a problem with quality at one mill or we have a problem with um, a strike, a union strike or something like that. That's why we have three suppliers. So um, we don't reduce the supply chain any further than that just because of the fear of having a line stoppage because of a uh, potential of a union strike or um, something to that nature so um the only other thing we could do is um, reduce the supply chain or reduce uh the distance it takes from you know rhode island to connecticut but it's not very far it's only two hours so um everything gets from the warehouse to the customer within 24 hours so 
there's not a whole lot of uh, time that can be made up there in the long run. Next slide. This is it. Last slide. Yeah. Hi, David. Uh, good job. Um, I think um, you guys have done team presentations uh, in every class. And when you're doing a team presentation, I should hear from everybody on the team. I know you guys have large teams, four and five people, and it's hard to do with seven. Uh, but uh, that's what you guys should have done. Uh, at least, at least share the wealth. You guys all worked on your master business project. Um, <clears throat> your supply chain map, as I mentioned, is uh, pretty good. So you got a simple ch supply chain. I gave feedback uh, to everybody, right? You, you all have a planning uh, section of it, and we, we talked about you could overlay your planning on your thread diagrams. You didn't have to do that. That wasn't the requirement for the for the assignment, but uh, uh, it would have been uh, okay to do that. Um, like you said, you got a pretty fairly simple um, uh, process here. You got to make the order. You got your M1. You got to deliver the order, and you got your S1 supplier uh, to order. Uh, I, I would suspect that, <clears throat> or at least understand that, at every every section of it, you know, your supplier's got a make and a deliver, right? As well as uh, your, your uh, boat zap and your raw materials are doing the same thing you guys are doing. Uh, I would expect that you have some kind of a return, right? So, so when you're putting your geographic map and thread diagram, you should look at this plan, source, make, deliver, and return, uh, and, and carry that through. Um, <clears throat> thread diagram, Fairly straightforward. Uh, looks looks good. Same thing I just mentioned. You got your suppliers. You're making your part at Eden, and you're delivering it to your customers. Um, your suppliers will probably have some some suppliers. So you got your your tier ones, which you got listed here, and they probably have some tier twos. You didn't have to do that, but just understand that you probably have a distribution. Eaton probably has a distribution center, so you probably should have put that in your thread diagram uh, before you did your D1 make to order. And like I mentioned, you could always, it's value to overlay um, your planning on your thread diagram. So if you remember why we do the thread diagram and the, and the geographic diagram is because we're looking at it. We're looking at exactly what you said. Hey, it's critical that we have just in time um, first pass yield has to be there, right? Uh, or on time delivery has to be there so you could meet your metrics of first first pass yield. Um, so that's what we're looking at. We build these geographic diagrams. We see when we have a disconnect, where we have issues, where we have problems, and that's why we build a thread diagram for the same reason. We, and then we can sit there and see where we can optimize, uh, eliminate it some ways to reduce the cycle time, improve the process. Um, so what you guys got here is very simplistic, hard, hard to look and say, okay, what I, what can I do to improve it? But that's, that, it's okay. You got the idea of what a score model is and all that. Great, pro, pro, great master business project, right? I mean, you only have 60% first pass yield and you're, you're getting almost 45K a month in scrap. Um, good project to work on. Where, how, where, where are you guys at? Have you done any improvement in, uh, in uh, improving the first pass yield or or uh, reducing your scrap. So yeah, we've already um, we've made some improvements or some suggestions that they've already taken and implemented, and then the final um, uh, portion of our project is a large scale um, cleaning process that uses a laser. So um, they're still vetting out the. Uh, um, the ability to use that because it takes a lot of customer uh, testing and stuff like that. So um, they're really interested in it and they're, um, they're, they're going through that testing, but it, they haven't been able to use it um, in a production environment yet because of that happening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that, you, it's a great master business project when you, you know, everybody's looking at first best yield. Everybody wants first time quality and reduced cycle time. Having adjust in time suppliers like you have, it's critical. It's good that you guys are geographically located, but, you know, today we had a nor'easter. 
you know, some areas got six to 12 inches of snow here in the Northeast. You also, uh, last Friday, we, we were pretty much shut down. So when you got, when you got that just in time supply base and you have days like you got today and, and days like you had last week, um, you gotta, you gotta plan for that in your supply chain because a, any interruption in just the time, uh, would hurt your numbers. But anyway, great job. Uh, team variation, uh, putting this together. Uh, also, also loved what you guys are doing here. Uh, looking at your material flow and, and making sure you're measuring the right thing. So, good job. Any questions from the class to team variation? This is the quietest class I think I've ever had. Okay. We'll get out of there and we will go to Team UTC. Edgar Cameron. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, this is Team UTC's uh, supply chain management presentation um, with Edgar Martinez and then myself, Cameron Helen. Uh, next slide, please. So here's our supply chain chart uh, at the micro level. And on the next slide, um, I'll show you the, the macro level, but <clears throat> it starts with the, you know, our planner will create work orders based on our customer forecast and demand um, in which the work order will be given to the stock room um, so that the stock room can supply the, the necessary parts um, that are needed. So they will deliver the parts and work order to our 737 production cell. Um, in which the operators will gather the materials and parts and um, as well as the paperwork that will be needed. Um, we do a hardware verification um, where they will install all the parts for that slide um, as well as start the CN form or the, the travel form that will follow the unit throughout the entire process. <clears throat> From there, operations will perform a, a functional test uh, fold procedure, so they're actually packed up uh, the evacuation slide um, and then from there we will do a functional test deployment to check the fit form and function um, make sure that you know the the parts are good that they're the unit integrity is good so forth uh, after that it goes to a squawk and paint and air retention test um, where we check for you know air retention we check for seam leaks pinholes you know damaged parts what have you as well as um, install barcodes and necessary or yeah necessary stenciling that the unit may need. Um, from there, it goes to OK Pack verification, where we check to make sure that all the stenciling has been applied um, and that it has passed its air retention tests and all the other uh, previous tests. And then it goes to our final folds verification, where they uh, will actually uh, repack the unit. Um, and then it goes to final dress up where <clears throat> operators will install the um, packed up unit into the compartment, which will eventually get installed on the aircraft. And then after that point, it goes to our quality finals inspector um, where they will do a documentation check, make sure the documentation is good, that all the uh, acceptance tests have been performed and have passed. Um, and then from there, they will sign the COC, so certificate of conformance. And after that, it goes to shipping, where shipping will prepare their side of the paperwork and then eventually send it, uh, the unit and the documentation off to our customer. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the macro level like I um, ex talked about earlier. So basically, it's you know planning will uh, get everything needed to send it to stockroom. Stockroom will provide everything for production. Um, production will uh, manufacture the unit, give it to quality to do their final inspection and paperwork, and then from there it moves on to shipping, and then shipping will eventually send it off to our customer. Next slide, please. So here is our success matrix, um, the four key ones, FPY percentage which our company goal is currently 98.8%. 
Um, but over the past three years, we are averaging 97.2%. And then uh, attack time, of course. So we our goal is 12 units a day, or roughly 37 minutes per process step. Um, there's mul obviously multiple process steps throughout the entire process, but the average is 37 minutes per step. Our ZDP plan, our, our zero defect plan, um, is more at the finals stage to where we want to make sure that there is no uh, defects found, which should you know, help increase our FPY percentage. And then our FTTC, our first time through capability, um, which you know, looks at you know, zero rework um, failures or delays throughout the entire process, which on the next slide, Edgar will be able to go more in depth on, on these four key aspects. Next slide, please. Um, just to touch back on the previous slide, um, albeit that our current FPY is quite high for this cell compared to our company goal, uh, because our this cell that we're working in is the lighthouse of the facility or the site, um, a lot of the projects that are to be put out to the other cells will be dependent on the implementation and success of our current 737 cell, and so that's why we chose this one. So again, that's the reason why that FPY percentage looks so high. Um, whereas if we if were actually able to improve and exceed that goal, uh, we can implement the, the recommendations upon their success to other cells which would better their FPY as well. And so in talking about uh, ensuring success, uh, to improve the FPY, our three main issues would have to be doing uh, improving our CN form or the traveler form as Cameron in, uh, indicated earlier, uh, the travels with the unit, and the major issues with this is that we're missing information, missing signatures, and QA stamps. Uh, so redoing the layout would make it more efficient, easier to read, and hopefully diminish uh, a lot of that missed information and opportunities that would cost us a, a lower FPY. Uh, the tag time, uh, moving or reducing redundant checkpoints. Uh, a lot of the times we had a new inspection checkpoint added because of something that may have happened down the field a long time ago. And so if it hasn't happened uh, in the last couple of years, we thought it'd be good to remove it uh, since it is causing another opportunity for a possible rejection in our finals. And it would also uh, speed up the process, thereby improving our tag time and being more consistent. Uh, the zero defect plan would just be to go through with all the with everybody, all the techs and operators within the cell, making sure that everybody's aware of what they're looking at, that they all look at it in the same perspective. And so with robust training and having uh, better acceptance criteria, we'd be able to eliminate a lot of the packing errors that we have or um, the damaged product at the finals end that has been rejected before and has affected the FPY. FTTC, uh, the first time through capability, is just making sure that every unit should pass without any uh, major failures or defects, meaning that when we receive the unit and we test it, it should pass 100% of the time. Um, even though we do have historical data of a lot of the issues that happen uh, in our process, uh, we want to work toward el eliminating all of them uh, so that we can increase the productivity of the cell, thereby getting more units done and meeting our on-time delivery to our customer. Uh, next slide. So we, we source from two different places. We have a one of our sister sites in uh, Bangalore, India. Uh, we'll send out one part of the unit, uh, being the, the inflatable or the main structural part, the tube assembly itself. Uh, we also have another supplier uh, here in, pretty much just an hour's drive away at the most uh, from our main facility. And so these two suppliers will deliver the products to our Phoenix site uh, where we will receive it. And as Cameron uh, indicated in the previous uh, uh, couple slides that uh, the planner would, uh, will get the work order ready, follow to production, finishing the product, packing it, and uh, prepping it for shipping to our customer. Uh, so from Phoenix, it's actually it actually gets flown out to a warehouse that is located up in near Seattle. Uh, it is also an hour, hour and a half um, drive away from our main customer being Boeing. And so this is kind of the staging area. 
uh, where they kind of hold some of the units before once Boeing says hey we're ready for for those units go ahead and deliver them our warehouse there will do so next slide and so this is the internal process um, although there's a plane on there on the left doesn't mean that we have it would be cool if we had an actual uh, runway in our facility but no it's just a uh, that was just to indicate that we get shipped uh, internationally and then national is our local supplier, so they drive the materials over. Everything gets delivered to our stock room. The stock room packages everything uh, that we need per unit and transports it over to our uh, uh, Boeing 737 cell. Uh, we go through all the process that Cameron described earlier in the micro uh, slide. Once everything is packed up, all the non-conformance or any non-conformances, FPY has been input and the unit has been deemed uh, okay to proceed to shipping. It does so. We ship it to the warehouse, I, as I indicated before, and then the units are actually uh, driven over to our customer Boeing. Next slide. So we decided to break up our, because we do have two different suppliers, we kind of broke them up on the left. Uh, we didn't, we know that our, our suppliers have a sub-tier supplier, and we just don't really know who those are. Uh, so that's why there's a, the, uh, those uh, D1s way on the left uh, deliver the stock products, which go into our suppliers, uh, the suppliers, then make to order those products, kind of keep a stock of them, and then they deliver them, they deliver them to our Phoenix site um, as we source them as make to orders. Um, from here, we go through that step of building the unit, testing it, uh, which is that, uh, that make to, sometimes we make to stock, and we also make to order. Uh, so it just depends on what our forecast is and what our levels are. Uh, depending on also the supply that we receive. Um, then I guess we deliver the stock, the deliver stock product, we deliver stock product or uh, deliver mid to order product, depending on, again, how those, how that forecast is, is going. Uh, we ship it again to that service center uh, warehouse up in Seattle, where it gets, after that, it gets delivered to our actual customer uh, who sources the stock, the stock product. So our, our on-time delivery, we wanted to be an 80% on-time delivery from our suppliers. We have had issues, um, even as team variants indicated in their presentation, we've actually dealt with one of our suppliers having a, a union strike, and so that's actually affected our, our productivity before. Um, but more than often than not, it's usually on time. Again, our, our goal for FPY is 98.8% .8 or, or better. And also the tack time of those 37 minutes per process step, which would mean that we would get our 12 units a day, which is the requirement set by, uh, by our company for now. And it would mean that we would also want to pursue to have a 95% or, or even better uh, on-time delivery. Of course, we do want to get that to 100, and that just depends on the forecast and any shortages or instances that may delay our processes. Next slide. And that is it. Okay, yeah, let's go. So I, uh, so I'm getting very proficient in the UTC process for evacuation slides. This is the uh, third class I taught this uh, recently, and uh, there's been folks from UTC working to improve the uh, evacuation slide processes. So. Uh, Hopefully you guys are in communication. The good news is that all all three of the last classes, you guys are focused on something different within your master business project. So you guys should see some significant improvements there in UTC um, at, at the Phoenix facility. Uh, so that's good. Uh, so excellent presentation. I mean, you guys went uh, overboard on uh, and uh, and showed a lot more than what was required, but it was good good understanding of your of your supply chain um, 
great understanding of your metrics, so that was good. Um, geographic map, superb, right? And by the way, one of your one of your the teams was working to in, improve that cycle time for uh, delivery uh, from India uh, to to the Phoenix facility. Uh, they had some really great ideas on that. Another another good simplistic geographic map. Excellent thread diagram. We got all the all the. The only thing that would make this more perfect would be overlay your planning steps on it. But but very good. Uh, by the way, <clears throat> you know when you when you're looking at a, a map like so you got it you got it spread out good because you say everybody has a supplier, a make, a deliverable within their processes and you. But this truly would have been a, a deep one uh, to the to your end customer, uh, and of course Boeing has a whole bunch of other steps when they install an aircraft. But but good enough, right? Good. Uh, so excellent job. Uh, took some notes, but uh, I, I thought your thread diagram was uh, one of the better ones I've seen in a while. So good job, guys. Any questions from the class to uh, to Edgar and Cameron? Good job, team. All right. And our last team, Prime Aircraft. Sir, um, Judith speaking um, of note. Jay, he's overseas in Guam at this time, and he's having technical difficulties, so you will not hear from him tonight. He's on. You can see him, but he cannot um, speak. He doesn't have audio. Yeah, he sent, and, me, he um, sent me a yeah, note. He's got no microphone on the, the computer he's using, so that's okay. Yes, sir. Um, thus, um, Matthew wanted to brief slide six, okay. our slide six, which um, reflects our MVP thread diagram. Okay. So I will begin. Um, so this is the composition of the team, um, sir, with uh, myself, J.E., Matthew, Megan, and Dakalo. And as you know, Dakalo is joining us from Africa. Yes. Um, slide, please. So I wanted to give you a uh, quick synopsis on our problem statement, which has been approved by um, our champion. Um, the main thing is the problem set being that H the HC-130 Juliet Combat King 2 aircraft um, having experienced uh, being experienced um, some significant downtime due to parts unavailability and excessive wait time. And so for our goal is to reduce that excessive time and also to bring the mission capability rate of the squadron um, higher. Then uh, it's already higher than the 82 percent. That's the norm for the for the whole um, command. But for the past for a couple of months that they were down, we're hoping to bring them down to a full 12 months at 85.7 percent. So that's one of our main goal in order to bring the unit back. We have to cut the time that the aircraft are spending on the ground, get the parts. And that has been one of the Achilles heel that we have to deal with, getting the parts on time. Okay. Any questions on that, sir? No, that's a, that's a good MC rate for a C-130 outfit. Um, so, yeah. And, I, and when you talk about aircraft availability and parts, uh, aircraft, you know, this is where you could drive costs, right? Air, aircraft availability, if you want to get to 85, 86, 87, 90, uh, you got to have parts on the shelf and ready and available, and that drives costs to the Air Force. So, you know, there's a there's a compromise there. You got you got to balance and find your sweet spot. But good, this is a good chart. So this slide reflects the um, inventory control points, the warehouse where we get our parts. As you can see, the by the legend to the to the left, 
Moody Air Force Base is in Georgia, and we have to go expect those parts from all of those different locations within the United States. And from the um, that that's the reason why one of our recommendation is to get um, to reduce the time that the parts spend being delivered and once they get to the warehouse on base at Moody's, the time that they, they get to spend there and the time that we get alerted that day there and so we could get them. Now we've been able to, um, we found out that the, the warehouse has extended their time and so then they're allowing the maintenance guys from the 71st to go and get the parts on their own. They don't have to wait for the parts to be delivered to them. So that has added a some positive aspect to our MVP and resolve at least one part of the problem. The second problem is besides the parts being dispersed throughout the states, we do have civilian civilian vendors that we have to deal with. And from the champion, we just learned that um, we cannot, we don't have the authority to interact directly with the civilian vendors. There's a specific location, a central, centrally location, central location on this map. I believe that's the um, Defense Logistics Agency, where um, for the Air Force, they they the ones that have the authority to directly interact with the civilian vendor. So we're under the impression that we could assign a civilian within the 71st to interact, and they were like, we were told, no, we don't have the authority. So. What we will establish is to get that civilian position where that civilian can interact with that military representative at that central location and since they have the authority to interact. So we're hoping to be able to establish that relationship in order to get the parts in a timely manner. Any questions, sir? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, so so that's uh, so that you got to be cautious. So I'm glad you you um, uh, the, the colonel uh, told you guys that the Defense Logistics Agency is the contracting organization. So within the Defense Log Logistics Agency, they have a thing called the Acquisition Center, and so does NAVSALT that you have there uh, for the Navy, and so does uh, CECOM, which is um, the Army uh, Communication and Electronic Command, those folks all have their own contracting office. If if we allowed everybody to talk to the suppliers uh, and the um, and the vendors, those suppliers and vendors will think that you're representing the Air Force and the C-130 uh, community, and they might take what you say that you need from them as a contract. And so you, we get in a lot of trouble. So that's why, but you, what you do with your civilian uh, contractor is have them uh, generate a relationship with the DLA and the air logistics centers and NAVS up if you're getting parts from them and CECOM and TACOM and everybody else, AMCOM. So, so you should, so, so once you build those relationships, let them deal with the contracts, acquisition center, uh, and and they'll go directly to suppliers. C-130's got a lot of parts. There's a lot of aircraft. Every well, every DoD um, um, agency's flying C-130s. So there should be warehouses full of stuff out there that should help you guys out. Okay. Next slide. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. So this is um, our distribution depot location. Um, these are our air logistics centers from where the non-vendor parts come from. To, Megan, um, Megan, let me, Megan, let me interrupt you. How are you feeling, by the uh -huh. way? Um, I don't feel too great. <laughs> uh, okay. It, you can... My trail is very, very sore. It's very difficult. Okay, well, well, I'll try to save your voice a little bit. I, I got, I have this. I, I already know all about these distribution centers, so you don't have to explain it to me. Uh, you okay. you can save your voice and, and get some rest. I'll go to the next Thank slide. You. Yep. Oh, maybe I'll go to the next slide.
Was Megan going to brief this one too? Because I'm good with this. I kind of got. This is this is an interesting one. And you guys said Matthew was going to brief this. Yes, sir. He's typing. I got, I got it. I'm seeing it. Yeah, so I agree with you, Matthew. Uh, this this thread diagram is a nightmare, right? Um, I, and I know I know we said to overlay your planning on there. A uh, lot of planning, right? So uh, you could you could overlay that very simplistic without all these uh, lines and and confusing. But but certainly understand that the um, the supply chain. Uh, for any of the aircraft within the uh, DOD services is a very complicated uh, supply chain. If you're really going to lay this thing out, it would be it would take up uh, an entire wall in a in a room. Uh, so the vertical movement is uh, is the process plan, right? Yep. By the way. How is uh how are you hearing me? You got uh closed caption on? Do you guys know do you guys know if the other professors are typing to him or or um or does he have closed caption? Anybody know? He had the the voice thing, okay. I guess closed, yeah. closed caption okay. that okay. will translate. Okay, good. I'm going to type back to Okay, I think we got it down on the thread diagram. Um, yeah, I, th I think the way you guys created this thing uh, makes it uh, not all that useful right, when you lay it out like this. Uh, but I certainly understand why you did it because you have a very complicated uh, supply chain. Is there is there particular parts that are causing more issues than than others? The ones with the civilian vendors are the ones that are key parts for the aircrafts, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and um, Dottie propellers. They have the most important pieces that we need, and that's one of the, re the main issues is to get them to send them the parts in on time. So the process through there, we don't, we're not sure how they have their own processes, of course. So that's why we are trying to get that in place with the civilian liaison. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that seems to be a concern with uh, how uh, how almost all the weapon systems are going. They're going to um, 
logistics providers and letting the supply suppliers, the uh, the vendors, um, um, manage portions of the supply chain. And I think it just adds confusing. Um, it certainly slows the cycle time. Uh, and and what what the problem is if they're not supplying the parts in a in a timely manner, that's when you want to talk with the DLAs, because like I mentioned, they're the acquisition centers. They set up that contract with the suppliers, and it's probably in there saying that um, that they have to deliver a certain amount of parts at a certain amount of time. So. Okay. Okay. We're gonna go to the next slide. We're good to go to the next slide. Yes, sir. It's done, I think. Okay. All right. So you guys are missing what do you try what are you you're trying to improve mission capability rates and how are you doing that? Mission capability rates, sir, is affected by the lack of parts coming well, in and the and the time. It's all interlinked and it all leads to the parts being available. Yeah. Hey, so, so what's what are you trying to improve in your massive business project? We're trying to improve the the monthly MC rate and reduce the number of substandard months in order to move months that we where we were below the 82 percent and you and you and you and you and you're saying the root cause is that you don't have you have part shortages yes and, sir so and how how are you guys fixing that i mean what do you i mean it's good that you identified the root cause and then, and then you also identified that it's coming from you know dowdy rolls royce lockheed martin boeing you guys got like i get what's how are you going to improve the MC rate and get those part shortages? A uh, couple of things that we looked at: the warehouses, the timing of the of the personnel working, or the warehouse being available, the supply depot being available, and we have been able to confirm that they were extending the hours. They were going to go to 24-hour shifts, and because the maintenance teams they work around the clock, and so them be, uh, the warehouse being able to allow them to go get their own equipment and not have to wait and the supply depot being open 24 hours then have alleviated that part of it at least we can we can streamline our process with the supply depot and the warehouses on base and um, we've planned we're planning on putting people integrating our own personnel within the supply depot and the warehouse and learning their schedule and being in, in fine tune with them. And so that leaves us with the civilian vendor um, as the main um, problem. And so that's why we were seeing that we're, we're recommending having the civilian liaison linking up with the representative, military representative at, at, those, at that um, location and being able to find a way to streamline that process a little bit better. We don't have a side on the contracts. We don't know specifically what the contracts say. That's one of the things as we were brainstorming, we we're thinking about maybe going back into the contracts and and maybe redoing redo them and that they would be more beneficial to us. But all of that now we're finding out is being handled by one specific person. So that's why we need to try to establish that relationship through our liaison with that media representative, um, the contracting manager, to get that done. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm just curious. I mean, you know, I, I lived this thing for 22 years while I was in the Air Force, so I was just curious what you guys were doing. Um, so on your on your base, you have a contracting officer. So I would go find him or her and talk to them uh and they got a little team in there that's told me uh, uh um they're so, they're located somewhere um it's not called cbpo anymore uh in the, in the personnel area they normally 
are at. Um, and they could, they could actually pull the contract to say how long Lockheed Martin has to get a part to you, what parts they're managing, what the period of performance is, and what their agreements were on, on, on on-time delivery and whatnot. And if they're not meeting that, then that KO, that contracting officer could actually deal directly with whoever, whatever agency signed the contract with Lockheed Martin, whether it was an ALC, uh, um, the DLA or one of the one of the uh, other DOD uh, like AMCOM or CCOM and NAPS up to just to help you guys out because it's hard. I know it's hard when you're on the base and you're not allowed to talk to the suppliers and you don't have a field rep there from the suppliers. Uh, what do you do? So maybe go to your KO on base and and they might be able to help you out as well. All right, good job. All right, nice, nice, nice work on everything. Uh, any questions at all for this team? No. Okay. Good. Good job. Death, all three. Red, death red diagram is gnarly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. If there's no no questions on the team presentations, you guys did a great job. Everybody did a good good job. Um, we'll move in real quickly, and I'll go through uh, uh, lesson lesson five. Uh, that way, you guys can get out of here and go take care of what you need to do. Um, so so my lesson five is all about supply chain maturity and the best practices uh, that's been identified to date in supply chain. Um, Guys did the reading. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, business process orientation, right? So, so a supply chain is really is is never as simple as it sounds, right? And you guys saw that while you're putting together your thread diagrams and your geographics, right? You have your suppliers, you have your producers, you have your distributors, and you have your customers that form a network of interrelationships, right? So it's an organized group of companies, and right, you guys were tr trying to do that when you were building that, right? Uh, so how do you to get it working properly? You got to harmonize that network for the benefit of the end customer, and that can only be really achieved through process focus, right? It was what you guys are looking at, right? And strategy for the customer and supplier relationship management, right? So s some companies are on their way to uh, supply chain mastery, and others have a real long way to go. Uh, so companies can be defined by their level of maturity in a supply chain uh, management. And that's why I shared that story. Some supply chains have or have mastered it. Others have a long way to go. And you can actually measure that uh, with, the, with this maturity model that we're going to go through tonight. <clears throat> so during the past several years, the concept of supply chain management has been maturing both in terms of theory and practice, right? So terms such as integrated supply chain management, supply chain optimization, supply chain collaboration have really become the focus and goal of many organizations, not only in the U.S., uh, but around the world. Global supply chain management has has emerged as a key competitive strategy. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, so. This is like a, you guys all seen org charts. This is a typical hierarchy um, vertical org chart, right? A functional orient orientation, right? It's reflecting the focus of people within an organization on specific tasks, right? <clears throat> and that still dominates uh, our industry today. So traditional organization style groups, people would like tasks together for, you know, for their operating efficiencies and the build reporting uh, relationship uh, processes. However, cut across all those functional boundaries, right? So if you were trying to lay out people in this hierarchical vertical vertical and try to put the functions in there, it really doesn't make sense today because all those processes and functions, um, um, like I said, cut across those boundaries and, and, and you have, you have, 
you have to interface between them, right? So that really requires the elimination of this power and authority uh, focus of a typical organizational hierarchy and bring it more towards the acti activities that bring value to the customer, like what you guys did, the value stream, right? Um, so we're going to talk about a business process orientation strategy um, that's fragmented with, within the process of your value stream. And that's on the next slide here. So <clears throat> you guys read that in, in uh, uh, a little bit in uh, hand filled in your reading, but um, uh, one of the one of the extra books that we told you to buy and I told you didn't need it because you're only going to read a couple of pages was a, a book by McCormick and Johnson. Um, and they talk about the port of value chain in there, right? And so Porter actually affirms that managing linkage within the value chain is an important aspect of a firm's achieving a competitive advantage, right? Uh, the linkages are all about the relationships between the activities in the value chains, the processes, what's going on there, the functions. Uh, so an organization must identify and manage those linkages, and they often cut across all the traditional organizations and those enterprise boundaries, uh, including those linkages with the customers and the suppliers, right? So processes then cut across the, these boundaries and having a business process orientation in terms of how processes are viewed, measured, and managed will promote both that internal and external communication, collaboration, and coordination, and then lead really to a distinct competitive advantage within your supply chain. And that's why you see a lot, a lot of supply chain organizations go into that business process orientation. Um, <clears throat> we don't have, you, you could, you could actually um, assess your, your business process orientation. Uh, there was a so assignment that we were going to do for week five, but we're not going to do that. Um, but, but you could look at it. You could look at it in the book and, and see what it does. Um, so BPO is broken down in a couple of different elements, right? Uh, you do a process management measurement. You do the process jobs. You look at the views of it, and then uh, and then you go through. I'm going to go to the next slide because we'll talk more about the maturity of it. Um, so process maturity really uh, proposes that a process has a life cycle that's measured by the extent to which that process is defined, managed, measured, controlled, and is still a factor, right? And maturity implies the potential for growth in your capability and indicates the richness of the process and the consistency with which it's applied across your organization. Thus, a process maturity model um, is a model uh, that depicts increasing levels of process maturity. And you could look, there's a source, you could look at the, the online, you could look at the capability maturity model uh, for software. Um, uh, you, you know, there's, there's a ton of models out there, but uh, some of them are, are better than others. <clears throat> so there's components of your business process, right? Uh, your, your BPO. So you're going to look at a process uh, view of the business, right? Structures that match these processes, jobs that operate these processes, management and measurement systems that direct and assess these processes, uh, <clears throat> customer focused, empowered, and continuous improvement orientated values and beliefs. So the culture of your organization uh, is, a, is a step in there. Um, and, and one of the ways you could do that is uh, there's a lot of folks who went out there and developed a survey instrument that helps identify an organization's level of maturity and supply chain process thinking. Uh, and, and and you could go, you could, again, you could Google that and look at um, the BPO survey questions. There's just a ton of them out on the web and across the Supply Chain Council uh, website has that as well. Um, there's a lot of exercise to assess supply chain uh, maturity. But again, it goes back. You're going to look at your plan, your source, your make, deliver, return, uh, and you, and look at the common themes in there. Um, and you could go through that. <clears throat> I'm trying to get right to the level of how, how we define maturity, right? <clears throat> so there's five stages of maturity. And, and it, it actually shows the progression of activities towards an effective supply chain management and your process maturity, right? 
<clears throat> so I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up here. So you got ad hoc, right? It's a supply chain, it's a supply chain management practices. Uh, and they're, it's saying they're unstructured, they're really ill-defined. Uh, there's no metric, metrics in place. Um, it's based on a hierarchy, traditional function. There's little collaboration and communication, uh, and which leads to unpredictable performance, missed targets, high supply chain cost, uh, and probably lower customer satisfaction. <clears throat> then you get to the defined phase. So you got some basic processes defined and documented. You got you might have a process flow shop, uh, flow flow charts, uh, but it's still basically traditional. You know, there's again, there's not a lot of coordination, collaboration, uh, communication going on with uh, with your customers and your suppliers. Now, now you're getting a little bit better in your maturity. You got a link, right? That's really that breakthrough level, like you, you see defined here, right? Uh, you got broad supply chain jobs overlaying the traditional functions. Um, and now you got a supply chain manager type job title leading it. You got cross-functional intercompany teams in there. You're now you're now you're meeting your metrics. You're meeting your targets. Uh, everybody, the culture has a continuous improvement mindset. You're looking for uh, root causes and, and ways to mitigate it, uh, and then uh, much more collaboration and communication going on. <clears throat> then you get to that integrated step. Now now that you really replaced all those traditional hierarchical vertical functions with uh, with structures based on supply chain procedures and processes. Um, you got your measurement and and, uh, and uh, everybody's deeply embedded in there. You might have advanced practices such as collaborative planning and forecasting, which, by the way, is 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 a best practice. And everybody that uses aircraft parts and uh, trying to improve supply chain should should be looking at that. Somebody in that supply chain organization should be regularly uh, doing collaborative planning and forecasting based on parts needed to ensure that those missions could be met at the desired levels um, and and if you if it was fully integrated and functioned properly that's where the maturity would be at but we know within uh, the DOD that they're not fully integrated yet <clears throat> and then you also get predictable performance in an integrated thing your targets are almost always achieved you'll see reduced supply chain costs customer satisfaction it, it gets up then you get to the highest level of maturity which is the extended level right um, the supply chains fully collaborated fully communicate uh, suppliers are treated as part of the uh, part and their partners are part of the process uh, all working in in common areas common processes common tools in place uh, trust is there uh, and uh, everything's working good so that's where everybody wants to be at extended <clears throat> and uh, you could sit you could start and uh, um, um, Within the within the uh, supply chain networks and business process orientation uh, models, you can start level looking at your maturity level. So <clears throat> those definitions that we previously talked about, and you can start mapping them on a on a thread type diagram like this. So this profiles a sample company that shows this company falls mostly in that defined and linked area uh, when it comes to having a process view where process is still undefined. Uh, the process structure component is most, mostly linked here, but while it appears process jobs have yet to mature to that linked stage of maturity. <clears throat> it appears that this company has a lot of room for improvement uh, since no areas fall within that integrated or extended level of maturity. Uh, so you could you could look at the definitions of the components on the bottom here, right? So process view is the documentation of the process step activities and tests, right? You guys all learned that as we went through this all the courses within this quality management system. Documentation of your process, your activities and tasks is is critical, right? And then process structures, the breakdown of those silos, right? The structures that include 
and horizontal teams now embedded in the verticals. You got partnerships, you got shared responsibility, you got shared ownership, and you got process jobs, right? Cross-functional jobs instead of vertical responsibility. Process ownership. You got you, you have titles such as global supply chain manager when you have that uh, uh, those horizontals uh, in there. <clears throat> and then customer focused process values and beliefs, right? Um, that that that's where they, they energize. It equals energy, energizing uh, the company. It's it's as such as trusting customers, sales forecast, uh, belief that the team members are committed to the common goals and continuous improvement. Uh, and then you go to process measurements and management systems, right? Uh, measurement systems in place. They're in there. You have uh, rewards for process measurements. You got outcome metrics. You got customer driven and team driven uh, uh, measures and you're rewarded in recognizing it. Right. <clears throat> and then you got the best practice tactics used to improve your supply chain performances are implemented. Um, and then you could get to that level of uh, of uh, of thing of um, maturity. <clears throat> So, so company, how does your company rate? And you could pop them in here and do that, right? Um, so remember, uh, I should go back a second, right? So let's see if I, what I want to say on this slide. Um, right, well, we got that. I'm going through a lot. I'm, I'm just trying to go through this quickly to. We could, you could you could read about it, but let, so what's the value of a supply chain maturity model? Why why would you do that? It's it's just like mapping out any process. If you don't know where you're at at any given time in your process, how are you going to improve it? Well, you know where are going to look at where the waste is and improve the cycle time. So that supply chain maturity model gives the gives. The, the ability uh, to quantitatively identify your supply chain position within your company. Uh, and it gives you within that framework of that cross-functional integration factors and best practices. <clears throat> so using this framework, you could, you could pinpoint areas of progress and, and stagnation, right? And so the maturity scale matches against those six measurement categories we just talked about, the ad hoc, the defined, the link, the integrated, extended, um, and then the process integration, process document, the collaboration and team, process ownership, process measures, process credibility, and all that. Um, it, th those categories will provide a visual scorecard um, of your current situation within your supply chain, and then you could start looking for areas of uh, of opportunities to improve, right? And so, uh, as you can see, there there are real re from this slide there are real rewards in having supply chain maturity, right? When you start getting to those higher levels, your supply chain costs are going to drop. Your profits are going to increase. You'll get better customer satisfaction. So you're going to get more sales, which brings in more revenue. Um, and and this this by the way, this charts right out of uh, uh, the supply chain council uh, supply chain uh, practice maturity model and performance uh, uh, measurement group. So it's it's real data that that came out. And we just took the took, took it over this, but <clears throat> certainly there's a value in understanding the the, the maturity of your supply chain. Any questions up to this point? I know I went through this pretty quick. No, sir. All right. <clears throat> so, so, so there's a blueprint as well for a supply chain, right? So if you, if you, we're looking at an analogy, right? You could say that, you know, you have an architecture, and they, they, he could, he or she could envision the form, fit, and functions uh, resulting from the building components of of glass, uh, wallboard, and steel. And once that building's constructed, uh, however, its occupants may or may not find the results of that integration to be as envisioned as the architect, right? <clears throat> so as the supply chain architecture assembles the components to construct a supply chain network, <clears throat> the resultant impact can be anywhere from process oriented and highly competitive to immature and dysfunctional, right? Depending on the successful integration of the components. <clears throat> so like buildings, 
that have a blueprint uh, to, to help in that integration of building, uh, so does supply chain. <clears throat> so what is the blueprint for a supply chain, chain network? Well, we'll answer that in the next couple of slides here. But, but keep in mind, your thread diagram and your geographical map uh, that we uh, just went through, right? <clears throat> so this illustration shows all the participants in a, in a typical supply chain, the network of organizations and companies who are part of that value chain that, that brings the product to the customer, right? So <clears throat> that's where you want to understand. That's why we did that geographic map and trace the thread diagram. So we know what the, the true participants of our supply chain are <clears throat> and, and where that value brings, right? And so there's definitions for those, right? <clears throat> you have a trading partner, right? An independent organization that plays an integral role within your supply chain, right? So by identifying the main thread and examining the business strategy alignment, and obviously it's, you start seeing an obvious set of supply chain players that will emerge, right? Players that contribute to that main thread, um, are your trading partners, your nominal trading partner, an orchestrator, and, and then your customer, of course. But those are the three partners, and you can start classifying them, right? Uh, so a trading partner is, is that independent organization that plays that role, right? And then um, there could be contract manufacturers, your, your tier one supplies, your third party logistics, and then you have a nominal trading partner. So remember I said this, you know, if you looked at um, the UTC slide we went over earlier for the evacuation slides, there was key suppliers in there. Well, there's <clears throat> tons, and, and it was even mentioned, I think, uh, um, uh, Edgar or Cameron mentioned it that the, they, the, their suppliers have suppliers, right? <clears throat> so some of those are trading partners. They're key suppliers. They're critical uh, suppliers that have the biggest part. They're the just just in time suppliers. Then you have those nominal trading partners that may be providing hardware every once in a while or sealants or some other things, right? But they still provide the essential network that glue to complete all your 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 uh, your point to point connections, your physical distribution flows, uh, and and whatnot. Um, and then and again, those those they could also be non man. They could be non suppliers that don't actually give you parts, right? Your wholesalers, your freight freight forwarders, your internet service service providers, and then the orchestrator is. <clears throat> I have a definition of the orchestrator. I didn't, I didn't have a slide on that. But the orchestrator is really the power broker for a supply chain network. And Hanfield actually explains that uh, in the book on page 109, I believe. <clears throat> so once you, once you identify those three trading partners, you can start looking at that supply chain and understanding what makes what, what makes work right <clears throat> so if you went in and looked at uh, at the apex uh, at ww apex with so american production of inventory control society but if you went in, in on their website um <clears throat> and by the way they're, they're the leading professional association for supply chain and operations manual uh management uh uh and they've been around for about 50 years. But if you went to there, they'll, they'll say uh, Apex um, supply chain principles, right? Build a competitive infrastructure, leverage the worldwide logistics, synchronize supply with your demand, measure your performance globally, uh, and have a belief that the supply chain creates value. There's no doubt a, a, a smooth running supply chain is going to create value, right? <clears throat> Again, remember we talked about that supply chain management is the systematic strategic coordination of traditional business functions and tactics across <clears throat> those business functions within a particular company or organization and across businesses within the supply chain for the purpose of improving the long-term performance of your individual company and the supply chain as a whole, right? It's also been defined as the design, plan, and execution control and monitoring of supply chain activities with objectives of creating that value building a competitive infrastructure, right? Leveraging that worldwide logistics, synchronizing supply with demand and measuring your performance globally, right? Just like the Apex uh, folks said, right? <clears throat> so 
doing doing that, you're going to have a good one. Um, so there's certainly best practices in supply chain management, right? Um, here's just the listing of some of them, but it's really all about optimizing uh, the supply chain, right? Uh, Building that strategy and planning for, for the supply chain network. Integrating with your sales and operating team, right? Um, having your, your suppliers manage the inventory. Almost a necessity when you're doing just-in-time type uh, training. So, and you want that quick response, right? Uh, everybody should be doing demand management and integrated sales, sales forecasting. <clears throat> if you got a bill of material that's more than 20 items, collaborative planning and forecasting is probably a must, right? Um, and then and then uh, available to make your promise. Sign, if you sign up for something, you've got to do it, right? Uh, and then consignment, forward deployment, and then that customer CRM, right? Customer relationship management, and then advanced planning system. Uh, again, it's all about optimizing that supply chain. Uh, and again, all the best practices are, are on that Supply Chain Council website. Continued on, right? Flow manufacturing. Uh, we've talked about implementing M MRP and ERP. Uh, we talked a little about DRP distribution, process management. Uh, you guys talked about uh, um, in your discussion questions this week. Great job, by the way. I like that a lot of you guys uh, talked about the balance scorecard. Uh, just about every organization, and you guys confirmed it, are using some kind of a, a balanced scorecard today. So uh, good job on that. We're not going to do any assignments in week five because you guys are jumping right into your massive business project team tomorrow. So in quick summary, uh, BPO, it's a key competitive strategy. It, that influences supply chain success. Uh, understanding where you're at with your supply chain and, and doing a supply chain maturity model uh, assessment gives you the ability to pinpoint where you need to improve on and where you got problems at, right? And then companies with mature practices, including their supply chain processes, um, usually have um, a better competitive advantage when it comes to cost and, and revenue and earnings uh, than their competitors. And then recognition of, of the architecture of your supply chain network is really critical. Under Having that blueprint of your supply chain and uh, critical to building that effect, effective integration among it. Amongst it. <clears throat> so I just said a whole mouthful. Any questions on anything I said? Or, or anybody got anything to share that's uh, similar? Uh, we use um, maturity charts, although uh, we haven't been heavily introduced into them. We have seen them around our facility, um, and even sometimes during during or after Kaizen's. I, I think actually before Kaizen's, they look at some of those charts to see if it's worthwhile to conduct it. Yeah. So yeah. So normally you'll you'll do your maturity. You'll see it's not a sub. It's a, a supply chain folks started it, but you'll you'll see a lot of it in manufacturing. So the manufacturing processes will do a, a maturity model on their processes. So you might see them at uh, at UTC and and other. Uh, manufacturing lines when you're walking around and looking at their Kaizen boards and whatnot. So good. Thanks for sharing that. A a anybody else? You guys are too quiet. Okay. I'm going to let you guys go. Uh, again, uh, remember to do your end of course evaluation. Any assignments that you haven't done, get to me, get to them. Get them to me by Saturday. Uh, I'm going to do all the final um, uh, grading Saturday, look at all the papers I haven't looked at, and then uh, I'll put all the final grades on, on, the, uh, on the portal by this time next week. And, uh, and once again, congratulations on, uh, on completing your quality management system. One course left to go, um, and then on to graduation. Uh, good luck in the future, all of you. If if you have any questions in between now and uh, and uh, 
and the end of the end of your course, please feel free to reach out to me. Okay. Thank you, I'll, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks. I'm going to stay on the line yeah. for a little while if anybody wants to chat. Uh, if not, have a great night. Thank you, sir. You do as well. Thank you. Good night.